is Wafa Al-Abedat. You are listening to the Women Power Podcast, a subsidiary platform to the Women Power Summit, the largest event in MENA, with the aim of empowering women and helping them achieve their absolute highest potential. Each week on the Women Power Podcast, you will hear honest, vulnerable, authentic, real conversations from inspiring women. These women will share their experiences and stories into what it takes to build a successful business and career. The podcast will share insight and inspiration and hopefully inspire action and lead change. Side note, even though we are all at home, we wanted to bring you valuable content. So this episode of the podcast is brought to you over Zoom. Please bear with the sound quality. Thank you. Mashaala Shamemri is a Saudi American aerospace engineer, aerospace entrepreneur, speaker, and influencer who was born in the U.S. and spent a few years of her early life in Saudi, where her fascination with space started. More specifically, she was inspired at the age of six while gazing at the stars in the desert. To feed her curiosity, she decided to learn how to build rockets that will enable her to explore space and one day take her there. As the first female aerospace engineer in the GCC, she realized that this title comes with an enormous responsibility to inspire others to join her field as well as other STEM programs. To reach the youth, she used social media platforms such as Instagram, Twitter, YouTube to educate her followers about her field and experiences and to inspire them to have a dream and persevere. Her influence garnered the attention of Macy's, PepsiCo and Dubai TV in campaigns to educate and empower youth. While based in Miami, Florida, she founded Mesha'al Aerospace at age 26 to pursue her ultimate dream of building rockets and going into space. You are obsessed with flying. I've seen you talk about your obsession with space. Is space still the goal? Is that where you want to go or are you over it? No way. I will never be over it. This is my dream is to go to space. Absolutely. And the beauty of what I do is the fact that everything that I take, so, so I can, like whether it's um, flying or scuba diving, they are things that I'm passionate about that actually supplement going to space. Because if you go to space, for example, you need to be a scuba diver because most of your training is done underwater. And if you go to space, it's best that you are a pilot because you need to know how to fly. Now, it's not required But it certainly gives, like if you're applying to become an astronaut, it gives them, oh, great, she's a pilot. Oh, great, she's a scuba diver. Oh, great, she has so many hours of flying. Oh, great, she has so many uh, dives uh, under her belt. Oh, great, she's she's super funny. She can be funny in space. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. So, I mean, personality goes, uh, uh, like it's a huge thing because imagine being confined with people that are annoying. It's not going to work out. And there are some people that are annoying and you don't want to be confined with them. There's a lot of movies about going to space. My personal favorite is The First Man. Like, I got claustrophobic watching that film. I was just like, get me out of this cockpit, you know? Have you seen a film that's like, this is as close to what I'm experiencing is? For me, it's uh, multiple movies that converge together to create how I feel. Uh, One of the movies I always loved is October Sky, The Right Stuff. Those are excellent movies. Apollo 13 was amazing because of like the detail and of how they went to the moon and the issues. Well, they never really got there because they had issues. But nonetheless, it was a great depiction. And so you live inside that moment. And so when I see all the stuff, I try to like imagine myself in these situations. And then it it's very emotional for me. Like, I think most space movies that I watch, even though people are not crying, I'm the only one crying because it's so emotional. I don't know why. In one of your posts on Instagram, you put a picture of your brother. And I know you talk about that experience when you were in the desert and you were looking at the stars. How has your brother inspired you to get into this program or to want to pursue this specific field? Well, my entire family have, alhamdulillah, been very supportive since I was a child. So my mother, instead of like, you know, a mother will be like, well, I don't know the answer to this. So therefore just like move on with your life. But my mom recognized there was something in me that like I w- it was like almost like a calling. You know, I looked to the sky and I was like being called. And so she recognized it. And so she was lenient in the sense that, you know, when I used to do experiments around the house and things would explode and all that stuff. She wasn't very rigid with me. She understood that this is this kid's process to try to learn. Yes, I don't want her to hurt herself, 
but I want her to learn and I will furnish whatever I whatever possible so when I was in like I think sixth grade my mom asked me what I wanted for my birthday and I said I want all the encyclopedias and she got me like I swear to god like over 12 encyclopedias and I was so ecstatic so my entire family, alhamdulillah, they were very supportive and recognized that there is a passion there that they must nurture, that they must allow to blossom on its own. And so, alhamdulillah, it was wonderful. And they encouraged me to pursue it. And imagine living at the time when I was six and I saw the, the stars. I remember like when I was a kid and because there were parts of my life most of it is in the U.S., but then some parts when I was trying to learn Arabic, I was in, in Saudi. And I remember one of the teachers was really mean to me. And she, when I told her, you know, I'm going to go to space and I'm going to be a rocket scientist and this and that, she's like, what are you talking about? You're a woman. Your position is to stay home. I was so offended. And I told her, maybe this is in your, in your world that you stay home. In my world, this doesn't apply. So just because this is your perspective, it's not my perspective. And you will see that I will do exactly what I'm saying. And I was so angry. So then I left and then I just was like, I am strong as a person and I have thick skin. So her comment fueled me to just prove her wrong. Whereas another child could be like discouraged. And it's un so unfair. Like it, it, I felt like it was so unfair. And so bottom line is, that's what's dangerous. I think people who discourage you and, and the personality of the person being discouraged because some of them will succumb to that and some will actually push the envelope and be like, you know, hell no, I'm not going to do this. I know that your parents divorced when you were very young and I've heard you mention in one of your speeches that you've had to pick as well which parent that you wanted to live with and your mother encouraged you to go to the States to be with your father which what a choice to have to make when you're that young. Can we zoom in on that, Masha'al, and on, on how you felt in that experience? You know, what was going through your mind? Were you traumatized? Yeah. So to preface this, you need to understand how everything went down. When I was really young, yes, my parents got a divorce when I was 40 days old. And for six and a half years, I didn't see my father nor my other siblings whom my father took from, from my mom. And so it was very, very painful. And so I've never met my brothers and sisters, which are my brothers and sisters from my mom and my dad, because they, it was, a, I guess, a very ugly divorce. And my dad took everybody. He couldn't take me and Sara, my sister, because we were too young. Uh, I was like literally like 40 days old. So it's not like you can do something with me. So then I was left with, with my mom and Sara. And I grew up with my mom and Sara until I was six and a half years old is when I finally saw my father for the first time. And I finally, to me, it's the first time he obviously saw me when I was born. But to me, I mean, I'm not gonna remember anything when I was 40 days old. And then for the first time I saw him and I saw my other siblings. And I saw in the six and a half years, I saw the pain and suffering my mother went through. And it was very, like it left a very strong impression on me. And it was very difficult. You know, like you're a child, you want to make your mom happy but you know that she's in pain and you have no idea how to fix it. So it was very difficult. So then when I saw my father, after I think a year and a half from there, or two years, about eight years old, he took us from my mother. And that was devastating for me because I had no control over that situation. I was taken from the only thing I know. I only met him two years before. And so from his perspective, maybe he thought like, you know, these are my kids, I love them and I want them to be next to me. But from my perspective, this guy is coming to take me and I don't know him and he's taking me from the only thing I know, which is my mother. And now he's causing me to cause pain to my mother by taking me, which I saw that pain. And so it was very, very difficult. So we were taken from my mom and we weren't un we were unable to see her or speak to her or any of that. So it was very, very hard. And fast forward, uh, once my dad realized that we don't speak Arabic, our Arabic has basically diminished completely, he decided, you know what, I don't want them to lose the Arabic, and then took us to Saudi, back to my mom. So when we went, we were ecstatic to be with my mom, and we, I, I was in Saudi, I think, for four years, and then that was where the turning point happened, is where I decided on my own, after going through that suffering, 
while I, you know, I'm very attached to my mom, I, I told my mom, I was like, mom, you know how my dream is to become a, an astronaut and to make rockets and to become an engineer. And I don't think I will be able to do it in Saudi. Uh, and since I have this opportunity, my father lives in the US for me to go and, you know, study there and try to pursue this. This is gonna, I told her like, it's painful. It like breaks my heart. And I remember, I will never forget it. The, the day I was supposed to fly, I was sleeping and it was the day I'm supposed to leave for good. And it was so painful. Like it, it felt like you're ripping my heart out. And then I remember listening to the Adhan, Adhan al-Fajr and I kept trying to convince myself not to go because it was so painful. So I was trying to convince myself like, I will never hear al-Adhan in the US. You know, maybe I should stay. Maybe this is a sign. And then I actually went to my mom and I said, mom. So I went to her and she actually told me, absolutely not. You need to think of your future, which for someone like my mother, who's very attached to her kids, it was a hard decision for her, for her to stay strong for me. And so I did, I went and that's how I was in the US and I did, I, you know, I went to high school and everything. And I did robotics and all that stuff. So a lot of people say, what drives you? You know, some people come and then they, you know, go nuts and party and everything. That wasn't really me because I figured I have caused so much pain and suffering to myself and to my mother and to my sister, Sara. Because imagine Sara and I are so attached because I had to separate myself from her, which is very painful. And at the time, of course, Sara was brushing it off, like whatever, but it really hurt her. So what drove me the most is that I have to try hard because I cause so much pain and it cannot go to waste. What's your relationship with her like now? Very strong. I talk to my mom almost every day. And what's your relationship like with Sara? What's she doing now? I think I call Sara like we talk maybe 50 times a day. Yeah, like at the moment I wake up, we talk the moment I go to, until she goes to sleep, we, we continue to talk. And then once she, she goes to sleep, unless by the hand, like she stays up late, then we will text. But yeah, we're, we're very close. She's the one who's managing me. Were you ever angry at your dad for just? Of course, many, many years. And did you heal from that relationship? I'm pretty close to my dad now. We had some difficulties. We had severe difficulties in the past. As you grow, and mature and you go through the phases of life. Like I feel like in your 20s, it's the realization phase. And in your 30s, it's the reconciliation phase. Because in my 30s, what I have recognized is to be a little bit more open to others' perspective. Now, I don't necessarily agree with some of his decisions, but also he's human. And at the same time, from his perspective, it seemed this is the right way to go because he's trying to do something good. From our perspective, it seemed like being ripped from somebody. And so it's hard. It's very difficult. And so you have to, in your 30s, try to consolidate and reconcile that, that pain and suffering and try to take something positive out of it. So, for example, yes, when I mean, there have been multiple things I've gone through in my life that are so difficult and so painful and could probably cause me to be like a totally different person. But thank God I'm not. And I think what it gave me is the strength and the discipline to be able to survive. And I think the, like people sometimes ask me, how do you have discipline? How do you like, I was like, my entire life has, you know, smacked me in the face so many times to have this sort of discipline. So it's like the hardship that you go through. I mean, my father's 100% right in saying hardship builds character, which is true. Because without that hardship that I went through, I probably wouldn't have the character I do, I have today. I wanted to ask you, who's been sponsoring you or supporting you? I'm I pay for it myself. I have been on my own, I think, since, well, technically even throughout college, pretty much. I got some help through some college. But for example, my college tuition, I paid for it personally, not anybody. When I was in undergrad, I did 75% of my tuition was paid by scholarship. 25% I took out a loan. In my master's, I paid $0 because it was funded by NASA. 
thank God. So I paid nothing and they actually paid me money to do the research, so it's great. So they paid my tuition and paid me a stipend. And I also had another scholarship as well. But anyways, they give it to graduate students, which I had also. So my master's was fully paid for by NASA and partly by this scholarship as well. So it was great. Then as soon as I, f I wanted to do directly go into my PhD, the problem is I had some my you know some death in the family and all the stuff and like my stepmom died who I was close to and that was really too much then I had issues with my dad and it was just really really pretty you know difficult and so when I graduated I had to start working with my masters I had I basically had to work so then I did, I worked for a very big defense contractor and so I when I started working there I realized now I have to pay the loan and then it was like, they gave me this like monthly payment that I had to pay. It was like $500 a month. And so I started paying it. And then I realized no matter how much this $500, it never, the, the total number never goes down because it has interest. And I was like, I, I can't handle this. There's gotta be a better way to get out of this thing. And you know, it was, it was a lot. It was like $70,000 in the, the 25% for four years is $70,000. So then I decided to have a tactic of saving money and then paying off big chunks as opposed to paying that $500 a month. So that's what I did. So I would save like $10,000 over a few months and then pay it off, $10,000, pay it off and so forth. And it took me eight years and I finally paid the $70,000 alone for my education. So I actually funded my education. How good did it feel to pay it off completely like the day of? Amazing. I mean, and, and you know what's funny is like sometimes... I would have like some obligations or whatever. And then my mom's like, did you pay off your loan? I'm like, no, mom, it's still there. And my mom would like encourage me, like save more and try to pay it off. So it felt amazing to pay it off because I was like, thank God. And if you look at the statistics in the US, it's insane how many people, but they die before they finish paying off their loans for school. It's ridiculous. So are you telling me that you've, like after college or during college, you've received no support from your family and the Saudi government. Like this is all 100% you. Because people see Saudi women, they think, okay, she must be getting backed up by the government or by her parents. No, I've been pretty self-sufficient. I mean, I'm sure I got a, a gift at one point from my family for something. But daily life, my income is from me. I mean, there was one time where I was really, really in a bad situation. And my mom definitely helped me out, for sure. Does that harden you in any way, just being so financially independent for so long at such a young age? Does that really toughen you up? It does. And I think also sometimes you get exhausted. I do get tired sometimes. Like, I mean, I'm happy I am, but it's hard because not every day is the same, you know? And it depends on what I'm doing, you know? When, you know, I have a consulting opportunity for a while, it's great because then I'm making money the whole time. But when I'm not, it's more like, okay, now I need to figure out what I need to do and what else can I supplement this income with? And so it's tough. It's tough. Sometimes it's very tough. What is working with NASA like? I mean, it's, it's such a glamorous, shiny, sexy brand. Is it as glamorous as it is on the back end? The beauty of NASA is its focus on science, right? So when I did my master's, the goal was, and the whole purpose of that research is to design a nuclear thermal rocket for Mars mission. People think that Mars is a recent, like our interest in Mars is a recent thing. And I have done multiple videos to illustrate that is not the case. So my job was to analyze what happened in the NERVA rover program and create a solution that mitigates those problems by designing a new rocket that is capable of sending humans to Mars. And that was basically, so it's, it's really exciting because you're like, oh my God, I'm developing the new stuff and you're a part of it and you learn so much and then you have an idea and then they're like, no, we're not gonna do this idea I'm like, but it makes more sense to do it this way. And they're like, yes, but then from a manufacturing standpoint, we're not going to be able to do it. I still, in that one point, I still believe that they should have semicircular channels. What did you not expect working with NASA? Like something you were like, oh, I didn't know this was how things were done here. Well, when I made the suggestion to my professor, 
And I said, you know, it was really funny how this, this idea came to me. You know, you, you're a master's student, a graduate student, and you're barely sleeping. Like literally, I, they would go three days and I don't sleep because I'm too busy and I have to do research and all that. I was drinking coffee at Starbucks and you know, like the, the, the sleeve that they put on there. So I was sitting there, the sleeve fell off and I opened it. And then the idea came to me. I was like, why are we doing triangular channels? This makes no sense. It should be semicircular channels. I immediately went to my professor with my, the sleeve broken. I was like, look, man, we need to have it like this. This makes logical sense. The distribution would be a lot better. We won't have hot spots and all this stuff. And he's like, no, NASA wants it triangular. I was like, I'm telling you, it makes more sense to have it like this. Can you please suggest it? And now, whether he suggested it or not, he still insisted on this triangular channel, which I still was like, triangular channels, you have an attachment point. And from a mathematical perspective, for sure, you are going to get hotspot and engineering perspective, and you're going to cause erosion because of the hydrogen. So I was really, so I was, I was disappointed in the fact, and I don't know if, I don't think it's NASA rejecting it. I think he may not have told them. If they come back to me now, I'll be like, let's redo all this. And I want it semi-circular channels. I don't want triangular channels. So they weren't as open as to new ideas as, as you thought they would be. Well, like I said, it's not NASA. I think my he claimed that they had they had their heart set on this triangular thing, and I didn't want the triangular thing. So I said I w- I'm insisting on this. My point is like it's possible that there is a reason they wanted it triangular that I'm unaware of. So it's not like a lack of they're, they're resistant to creativity. They are not, and not be, and, and I'm not saying that my professor was resistant to creativity either, but perhaps there was a valid reason. For example, I know this from experience in the real world, because when you're in the research world, you're always trying to search for the best possible thing and you're trying to optimize. Whereas in the real world, they'll tell you, uh, we can't manufacture that or it's gonna be more expensive to manufacture that. Therefore, you're gonna have to suck it up and just do it this way. Are you interested in developing your own podcast or your own show? We want to help you make that happen. We can assist you with branding, conceptualizing the concept and theme, writing your intro and shooting it, editing your podcast episodes, developing a podcast schedule and theme, and creating social media content for your listeners and followers. We want you to have your own platform and space to express your point of view. Contact us on obinehill.com or DM us on Instagram, and we'll be here to support you. You recently got your license to fly, which is awesome. I just want to know like that best moment, but then also the disastrous moment. So just to clarify, I, I've been a pilot so far. For, so the, this recent one is for the commercial pilot certificate. So that means okay. I can actually fly and get paid for it. Before that, you, I can fly, take passengers and everything, but I'm not allowed to get paid for it. So that's the difference. So I actually have two certifications and one rating and one endorsement. So I'm a commercial pilot with instrument rating, meaning I can fly in bad weather and take people for hire, like for compensation and hire uh, and to work in the industry as well. Now, in terms of like a situation that I have been in, I think there was this flight that I took, uh, two situations. First, in, in terms of a scare, uh, we took off from my airport in Tamiami, and as I was climbing, it was a we we flew in bad weather, and specifically we filed to fly in bad weather, but we did not anticipate there would be a microburst, which is like when there's a very strong downdraft, and usually it's very difficult to anticipate, and it wasn't, and I don't think it was a very severe microburst, but with this plane I'm flying even like a non-severe microburst or any sort of downdraft that is significant is going to affect your plane. So we enter and I was flying with the instructor because you, for this particular flight, you needed to have someone with you. So I had an instructor with me. And as I'm climbing up, I'm about to level off at 3000 feet. As I'm about to level off, he like yells at me, don't level off, don't level off. And then I was like, what? And he's like, don't level off. We are in a, in a microburst. I was like, I didn't see it. Because usually the way to detect that you're inside of a microburst is all of a sudden, as you enter from the, 
from the front, you're gonna have an increase in performance without you adding anything. You know, you're like you're gonna have higher speed than you were, you were anticipating, then, but you know, all the stuff. I was like, I didn't notice anything. And he's like, no, no, we're going, keep it up. So I kept it up. And then because he freaked me out, it was very difficult for me to, because now I'm blind. I can't look outside because I'm inside of like this basically white sheet. So you can't see anything. So I have to trust the instruments. I can't look outside. And now I'm, I'm maintaining so that I don't lose altitude. So then I, I was trying to maintain my heading and I was like drifting 15 degrees this way, 15 degrees this way, 15 because I was like trying to maintain it and not go, it was like ridiculous. And then after 15 minutes, no, we came out of it pretty quick. Like I think within maybe a few minutes we were out of it, but we were still like blind because we were in the clouds and I continued. And then another microburst came and then we had to go through that again. And so that flight was a little stressful because you know, no one wants to be in a microburst with these little things. And then the second thing that happened to me, we were flying north of Miami, like close to Gainesville. And it, this particular flight was supposed to be two hours day and two hours at night. So you land and then you refuel and come back in two hours at night. As we were coming in and I'm flying this uh, low wing uh, complex landing gear airplane, the Piper Arrow. And the other issue happened in the Piper Arrow, by the way. So. I'm flying in about 20 minutes or 15 minutes before we land, the alternator light came on, which means the alternator has failed. So when the alternator fails and we were flying, the alternator belt fails, which means, so you have to troubleshoot to see maybe you can, maybe something you can fix. We troubleshoot, we, we did the troubleshooting, it still was on, so now, the a lot of your electronics are depending on the battery because the alternator basically will charge your battery as you're flying now if you don't have your alternator working the engine will continue because it's on but a lot of the stresses are on the battery and you only have if you're lucky if it's a good battery about 30 minutes so technically this is not a good situation to be in but luckily this happened 20 minutes into our flight and not you know one hour before taking off because then we would, have had to, we would have had to declare an emergency, deviate and land somewhere. So we didn't have to declare an emergency or anything because I was already on the, because I was doing an approach at that airport. You wouldn't be interested in flying without also thinking about, God forbid, dying, because even space, like these are just, all these experiences are very, I don't want to say scary, but like, what's your relationship with death? I don't think I want to die. Okay, we know that you either go to hell or heaven or... But there isn't someone that went and came back and told us what's going on. You know what I mean? It's like your belief that takes you there. And to be honest, I don't know. Like, I don't want to die. For me, honestly, I've never associated flying with death. Ever. I associate flying with freedom. Like... Okay, there have been cases where people die, for sure. Like there was this, a few weeks ago, this uh, guy who had a lot of hours, who was a student, but he already had his certifications. And then he was flying with an instructor and they died. They had engine failure and they wanted to land on the street, which is standard procedure. You have engine failure. There's no airport and you're at a low altitude. You land straight ahead. You find a road and you land there. And you would declare mayday, mayday, mayday. I have two people on board or whatever, and I am in this particular position. I am landing. Turn off your comms. You shut off the, everything. You open the doors and you try to land. And the main reason you open the doors is if, God forbid, you jam, you, can, you are able to leave. The problem is, as they were coming in to land on the street, there was a power line. They went through the power line and they died. It was the worst case. But I don't really try to focus on that. I focus on the happiness of flying. My other question was, you've said this in a few interviews, but a woman has to work four times as hard as a man in my industry. And do you feel like you're always the minority in the room? Like there are so much more males than females. Why do you think there's more men than women in your industry? And why do women have to work four times as hard? To give you a statistic, I just looked at the US data recently. This is not flying. Okay, flying is even worse. But... Keep in mind, I mean, when I talk about these averages, 
or statistics, they're not weighted. So for example, when I say in my industry, for example, aerospace engineering, there's only 15% women, 15, one five. It's great, but we're in like 2020, for God's sake. So the percentage is really small, which is very interesting. And then, but if you look at the CEOs of most of these companies, they're women. But that's an, a recent development of some sort. When I say recent, I'm not talking about like two years. I'm talking about like the span of at least 15 to 20 years. For example, SpaceX's president is a woman. Lockheed Martin's CEO is a woman. Northrop Grumman's CEO is a woman. And, and so forth. There's many, many. Uh, GD's uh, General Dynamics CEO is a woman. So there's so many women now in these positions. Some of them uh, have been there for a while and some have recently given their posts. But overall, the aerospace industry is 15% dominated by women. That's it. I think, so there's two elements I think that play a role here. Either women go into the industry and get discouraged and leave, or some enter the industry and then uh, they decide that they want to have a family and decide to choose not to have a career and a family and to choose just to do a family. Now, I've, I know some women who have a career and have a family. So it's not like it's gonna stop you. I think one of the things that we can do as a society to enhance this environment is, first of all, encourage more women to join this field, educate the males to be a little more uh, inclusive, now, in my experience, many males have been very supportive, but there are some that are, have severe like emotional issues or something because it makes no sense. And I've experienced those directly, so I can speak from experience. And another thing, for example, the thing that really bothered me is when I was working in the industry, I loved what I was doing. I loved it. The issue is I felt like I worked so hard and then this other person gets recognized for the work I did that he didn't do. And he was taken off the project. I was like, why is he getting record? I'm the one who did all the work. I'm the one who stayed up until 2 a.m. So get like, it's almost you feel this, like they're unfair to you. And that I experienced directly. And so I was like, this is ridiculous. I might as well just go work for myself and reap the fruits of my labor. And then I was chopped and I left. So, but I'm not saying that that is the trigger for me to have left, but it was one of the elements that bothered me. So I felt like there has to be some form of improvement there. I think that if I had a, a like a company, like to me, a male and a female are equal. Like if I had to hire somebody who's male or female, their gender is irrelevant. To me, their scientific merit is what, and their, their experience is what matters. So that's what's important. So it's not like I'm, I will favor hiring a woman just cause. No, I will only favor the person who has the merit. So that's what I'm trying to say. But what I'm trying to say to the entire industry is that they should be more uh, inclusive in the sense, for example, if you are a person who wants to have kids and all that, there should be a support mechanism. For example, where I worked, I remember they actually had a feeding room. So that shows like companies are trying to be more inclusive. They had a feeding room in case you have a child. Some of them had daycares within the facility. So I think more of this will enable more women and then encouraging women. And then also the pay scale is still unfair. Males still get paid more than women, which makes no sense to me. Like why, if they're making, doing the same thing, they should be paying, be, being paid exactly the same. This is a really nice segue into your entrepreneurship journey, but I just wanted to just tap into a statement you made, like I had to work four times as hard as a man to get the same recognition or to be made aware of. Can you just go into how you got that feeling or how that was evident to you? What happened was I was really good at what I do. And so I was very good at creating predictive codes that model the behavior of a rocket, but do so generically, meaning you can change the rocket shape and all you need to do is change a few things at the top and that's it, you run the code. The rest of the code is done. This gentleman came to me for help. And remember when I, you work in this industry, you have something called a charge number, meaning because every project, you have to account for the hours you spend on each project. So he had a completely different project than me and he came to me because he needed some help. So I asked him what he was doing and he was basically doing every case by hand. 
I was like, why are you doing it by hand? What is wrong with you? So then he's like, well, can you help me write this code? So that I wrote the code. And then I started modeling his stuff because in his program, they were very fast paced and they would change the design of the rocket every five minutes. So imagine having to do it by hand every time. So I was like, no, let's just do it this way. So then I always write codes with the mindset, what if things have to change? So this code needs to model everything the same way. And I can just change the, what it looks like, or how many sections it has and whatever. So then I wrote the code. And I remember that night, he, when he came to me for the first like few minutes and I realized it's gonna take me a few hours, I said, look, you need to get me a charge number because I cannot leave these other projects I have. And so he asked his supervisor, can Mish help me? And his supervisor said, yes, you better get me the data. So then I went, I, that day I was at work at six in the morning. I finished my work, continued with his work. I, I left the office at one or 2 a.m. Okay, from six in the morning till one, two a.m. the next day. Next day I come in, they even give me more work from his project. So then I start working on it. And now I'm working three different rockets plus his rocket at the same time, because I still have to deliver on my stuff. So now I'm like staying nonstop. Eventually his supervisor recognized he doesn't need him. He needs me. So then he removes him from his, the project, puts me on the project. And now I'm going like a whole month no weekends whatsoever. I swear to God, a whole month I had no weekends. I worked 22 hours one night, 22 hours to deliver stuff. I was so exhausted and I would go one month, no vacation, no weekend, nothing. And I didn't, I didn't mind because I'm a workaholic anyway, so I enjoy what I'm doing. But then this kid gets recognized and I don't. I was like, he's even off the project. I don't understand why he's getting recognized. So I was very frustrated. I worked like definitely harder than him and I didn't get recognized and not that I wanted the recognition, but you don't have to recognize him. Don't you, if you don't want to recognize me, that's fine, but don't recognize him for stuff that I'm doing. So you started your business, I think for that reason, just to take control of your life and your fate and to kind of run your own projects and do your own work. Being an entrepreneur is really different than working for an organization. You are now dealing with hiring employees, payroll, accounting, finding an office space. Did you feel ready to do all those things? Did you sign up for this? Or are you like, I don't want to do any of this stuff. I just want to be the engineer. I want to build the stuff. Or did you adapt? I can wear many hats. That's the beauty of what I learned. And not only that, I can learn as I go, which is what I learned. I have to say that the amount of learning that occurred from starting my own company was like exponential. When you're an engineer working for a company, you're not worried about meeting the bottom line. You're not worried about finding money. You're not worried. It's not your problem. It's someone else's problem. As an engineer working as an engineer, all you care about is delivering on engineering stuff, designing the stuff that you're supposed to, modeling the stuff you're supposed to, doing the testing that you're supposed to. You're not worried about money. You're not worried about the, having the right people. You're not trying to figure out how much it costs to get you the code or to find the, the software or what the, you know, all the stuff. You're not doing any of that. You're just doing your work, which is rockets and design, predictive analysis, wind tunnel testing, uh, flight testing, modeling, and all that stuff. And that's it. It's enjoyable because you have, you have none of this headache. When you start your own business, first of all, you have to figure out how to start your own business. What do you need to do? You have to register the business. You have to find an accountant in order for him to explain to you how to do everything. You have to file taxes. You have to be involved in the tax process. You have to hire people. You have to find an office. You have to hire the right people and look for certain qualities and in individuals that you're seeking. And you have to have the capability to test them on their knowledge to try to understand, are they people that know their science or not? You have to test them on, because a lot of people can claim like, oh, I know how to use CAD. Great. Now you give them CAD and they have no clue how to do it. Oh, that's not cool. So then you ask them detailed questions or you give them a problem or you send them a problem. Sometimes I used to send them a question for them to do at home and then deliver back to me because it's critical to understand what they do. And then some people are like unrealistic about what they're expecting for their compensation. And so you have to make sure that what you're giving them as compensation meets at least the average or within the average. It can't be overpriced or underpriced. 
So these are things you have to learn on your own. Now you have to learn how to actually create a business. You have to create a business model. You have to understand the market. You have to do a feasibility study on the market. You have to know what is the gap in the market and what you're trying to tap into. All these things did not exist as an engineer. So th these are things you have to acquire. Which parts of the things that you mentioned, like what's the one thing that you enjoyed and that you felt like this is so natural to me versus what is this headache? I don't like this part of, of, of running the business. I think what I learned is that I am definitely a leader. It's natural. Like it comes naturally. Um, luckily, I'm a good writer because when I wrote the business plan and I had investors read it, a lot of them actually, they were like, uh, who wrote your business plan? And I said, I did. They're like, entirely? I said, entirely written by me. And so they really liked the, the logic and the, the way it flowed. It was just too risky of a business for them to put money in. So the part I don't like is money. I don't want to raise money. Like I, it's because I guess maybe because I have a painful experience. Because remember, when I put a lot of my sweat blood and tears into my business, I had an investor that was fully vested. The problem is you ran into some financial issues and couldn't meet. And so I have to, I had to look for investors and that investor really, I think his investment in my business was because he truly believed in me as a person. So, and he truly believed that I can succeed. So it was more of an investment in me than in the actual business, because he knew that if I had something in my mind, I would get it to fruition, which we did. We actually tested the rocket. When I went to multiple investor meetings and I tried to pitch my business, a lot of the people that understand aerospace told me, Mish, how were you able to do this with the little people and the amount of money you spent? I said, because we're resourceful and we know how to do stuff with the little people and the amount of money we spent. And I said, this is why we want to, because we want to create a cost-effective rocket. So that part of delivering and presenting, I have no problem with. But trying to capture the money and, and, and have convinced the investors, instead of investing in a building, you should probably invest here because this is innovative. This is going to disrupt the aerospace industry. And we were, we were the first people to try to do this. SpaceX started in 2006. We started in 2010 and we wanted to create cost-effective rockets that are not competitive to SpaceX, but the target market was small satellites. Today, you have so many different companies that want to do the same thing we did. And so it hurts sometimes to see that because I knew I was ahead of my time. You know what I mean? I was ahead of my time. I was on the right track. I was on the right target. We were, had the right rockets. We designed right rockets. I just was unable to get investors. Because it, what they, all the investors that understood aerospace put money in SpaceX. And so they don't want to put it in another rocket company, even though they're not competitors. It's too high risk and long term, which I understand. We at Tobin Hill have over a decade's worth of experience working with some of the world's most successful brands across F&B, retail, culture and hospitality. We are equally at home helping a brand define its point of view positioning a new development, designing product, packaging, or creating content that speaks to an audience. Whatever the challenge, we deliver sharp, intelligent content-driven work that helps brands amplify their message to customers around the world. Contact us on www.obionhill.com or DMing us on Instagram for your public relations, social media, and branding needs. Somewhere along the lines, are you thinking of raising funds again? Or is that that ship has sailed, I'm done with this chapter, on to the next? One of my goals is that I have to have a rocket company. I have to. It's a necessity. I would like for it to come to fruition, really. Because it's innovative. The idea, my goal was, we need to make space more accessible. Therefore, it has to be cost effective. In other words, I want people to launch for space just because. That's how much I want to push. And if you have more, the more launches you have and the more eye you have on cost, one of the main drivers for how you control the cost is you actually become the developer. So instead of, let's say, I buy a rocket engine from somebody, I actually manufacture the engine. Then I have control over the lead time and the cost. And when I give it to my clients as a service, when I launch them, I'm not giving them the service with cost plus. I'm giving it with cost plus plus my profit margin, not the rocket. Now imagine if I bought the rocket motor from company X 
I bought it for like, I don't know, I'm making up a number, a million dollars, right? When I bring it on and then now I have, I complete my rocket parts and then I bring in a payload, I'm not gonna charge them a million dollars. I'm gonna have to charge them probably $2 million to try to make a profit. But if I manufactured this and it cost me 500,000, all I need to do is then just charge a million. You see where I'm going with this? And my question is, have you thought about crowdfunding? Very uh, difficult to do crowdfunding for rockets because the amount of money we're trying to, I, I thought about crowdfunding. I even thought about going public. Maybe that's gonna give me money to be able to. But there are certain restrictions that you, when you develop a rocket, the hardest thing is the fact that you are in development phase for a while before you have a commercial product and you have to go through a lot of testing to do so. So the main issue for me to do, for example, some big companies are like venture capital, they want you to be post revenue. You can't be post revenue if you're still in development. You're not, you can't sell anything until you actually get to commercialization. And we need in the tens of millions of dollars, so like 30, 50 million dollars to get to commercialization. Like how much investment were you trying to get? At that time, I wanted $30 million to get to commercialization. And anything less than that is not feasible. If you, like for example, if I got $5 million, I would have been able to finish the suborbital rocket. But in order to get to commercialization of the orbital rocket, I needed at least $30 million. And so like, if you ask me today, Mish, if you wanted to restart the company, first of all, I will redesign the rocket completely. I already have, I already, like I sat down with myself and I said, if I had to redo this all over again, what would I change? So then I, I had like lists of things I would change. And one of them is the architecture of the rocket would change. So the design of the rocket would change. The second thing is, I think I would start again if I could secure a hundred million dollars for this. Like if I have a hundred million dollars in the bank, I would start right now and focus on developing it until commercialization and then a few other developments. Like in other words, I, I will focus to get to commercialization, maybe have six launches. And then from the, after the six launches, I need growth capital because this type of business requires more money to be pumped in. Once you have shown that you are capable and now you have contracts that have been signed, which is what hurt me the most is that I have letters of intent from clients saying, I'm, I want to launch with you. I even had one from one of my clients that said, I want to launch as a guinea pig on your rocket because I want to support you 100%. The problem is I was unable to secure the funds to be able to give them. Well, remember, I already put in $2.3 million into this business. That's what got us to a successful hybrid rocket booster test, static test. And it was very painful for me What's painful is that we successfully did the test, but then I had to put the company on hold because I don't have any money. And I don't want to file bankruptcy. I, I, I did it the right way to do the exit strategy. So a lot of this experience, because you touched at the beginning about experience and how did you do it. I was 26 when I started the company. So a lot of people are like, you're young, you don't know what you're doing. I think I did the honorable thing because when I recognized that I was having difficulty after two and a half years of looking for investors, I had employees that I was paying and everything. And so I was very honest with them in March. Our test was going to be in August. I sat down with them in March and I said, guys, I need to be like clear with you. I don't have any money to pay you past September. And you need to know this from now because you need to make plans. If I can get an investor between now and September, that's great. But if I don't, you need to recognize that I'm telling you from now that September is the last payroll I can give you. And so I told them this and I said, you have a choice today. I will not fault you for making any decision. It's your choice. Either you stay with me to do the static test or you leave. I, I respect you either way. And every single last one of them said, I'm going to stay because I want the static test to happen. And we, they did. They actually stayed and I paid them September and that was it. Couldn't pay anybody else. And then, for example, I had to deal with the lease for all the office and the, where, the big uh, manufacturing plant that I had. I had to sell off all the machines. So it was a lot of stuff that a lot of people are not exposed to. And you will never be exposed to just being an engineer. You will only be exposed to as an entrepreneur who's dealing with the worst possible position, which is diluting whatever you have. And, and then to have to negotiate, because when you lease for offices, you have to lease for a, a, a long term, not one year, longer than one year, like it's three, five years or so. And you have to break that contract 
and you have to negotiate. And I had to negotiate my eyes through that so that I don't have to pay it for another how many years and for them to understand my position and not like cause an issue for both the facility and the offices, which was difficult. It was very difficult. And to maintain your composure through all of this. And, and I used to, I remember before I go to the office, at some, at some point I have this like anxiety from the fact that I know I'm going to have to shut down and I actually exit from 836, cry my eyes out, come back on 836, head to the office and pretend like I'm okay. Because you cannot destroy the morale of your employees. You have to always be positive. And to go in crying and falling apart, they're going to feel like, what kind of leader do I have? And I love the story about how you shot that rocket up. You had enough money to test one rocket and it was such a crazy 48 hours and everybody was trying to fix it because you had to delay it by a day and you were like, uh, this thing is flying today, it has to fly today. So that also, me listening to that story really stressed me out. Yeah, but just so you know, it's, it was a static test. It wasn't flying. You hold the rocket down and fire the engine because you're trying to assess the propulsion system to see if it performs based on your design. So it didn't actually fly in the sky. You actually hold it and fire the engine. It's a, it's a type of assessment of the propulsion system. It's called a static test. And the reason why it's called static, because you're holding it down. So you don't allow the rocket to actually fly. I work with a lot of companies who it's so hard for them to let go. They sometimes can see things failing, but they're just, they hold on because it's just really hard to shut it down or make that decision or pull the plug. So it is like a traumatic experience. And a lot of people afterwards just don't want to go into business. They'd rather get the job or get a, something secure and safe where they can check out on time and they can have that work-life balance and not have all that headache and that drama. So it takes a special kind of person to put themselves through the pain and still come out the other end smiling. You see, I always say two things. It's better to have tried and failed than not try at all. If I didn't try, okay, granted, I didn't achieve my ultimate goal of having this big company. I downsized, but I did successfully complete a static test, which means I know how to make rockets. And I know how to get the right team to create these rockets too. So it's not just, because you can't make a rocket by yourself. You have to have a team. I learned that I am capable and I am capable of huge things. It's just certain things are, were not aligned for me. And so this was an experience to teach me something. And it did. And I'm proud to have done it. And I think while it hurts, I would do it over again. Except with the knowledge I have now, I would uh, make some changes. So how are you making a living now? What's, are you working? Are you starting another company? Are you writing a book? Are you getting paid for public speaking? Where is your revenue coming from? I get revenue, obviously, from public speaking. That's for sure. And then I also consult. And I have like several projects that I work on. Do you consider yourself American or Saudi Arabian or just Mashal? I'm definitely both. For example, if I only lived in Saudi and wasn't exposed to the family, like if I didn't have my family, for example, and if I didn't go through the things I went through, I don't know who I would be. I think it's that hardship that I went through that caused me to be who I am. And that person that developed could not have developed without being exposed to both being in the US and Saudi. I think it's a a medley of both that made me. So I, I cannot, you know, like if you say, let's go back in history and prevent you from going to the States, I don't think I would be who I am today. And if you said, just you're just, you were born in the US and you stay in the US and you're not exposed to Saudi whatsoever, I think I still wouldn't be the same person I am. So I think there's no way I can exist as a single direction person. I have to be a medley of both. I get sometimes visions of my future and these like snapshots of where I imagine I could be or where I could be. And I, and I feel like it's, you know, I'm heading towards that direction. Do you have visions when you, you know, when you close your eyes or when you're about to sleep or when you dream of your experience in space or do you just have certain images are coming to you you said in the beginning that when you look at the stars space was calling you so do you have any visions that come to you that have to do with your fate or your fantasy or absolutely i have like a whole story i think the story goes i go to space and then i cry 
And then, you know what worries me, which is really funny? I, as I'm having this vision, I cry, I'm like in the spacesuit, in a spaceship, in a rocket, taking off from Earth. The countdown is happening. I'm getting goosebumps. As soon as we take off, I am so overjoyed and I start tearing up. The problem is now I'm in space. What's going to suck out my tears? Because they're going to be floating inside my mask. So then I'm like, what am I supposed to like? Maybe I should train myself not to cry. Like I'm thinking about these details. So then I get to space. Somehow the tears are not causing an issue in my face because now we're weightless and they're like probably hitting the mask or something. And then I get to space and I achieve a lot of good stuff. I spend a lot of time in space and then I come back. Now I have achieved something that I've always wanted. And I hope I have that serenity of peace that I have achieved what I came here for. But the truth of the matter is that purpose of me going to space is not only my own. It's not for me only. It is meant to encourage the youth that if I was able to do it, they are definitely capable of doing it. So it's my journey while there is a selfish aspect of it. This is my dream. I recognize my responsibility is ginormous because just you, I was called upon. I was lucky to be called upon. And sometimes maybe I feel like it's too much of a responsibility. But the truth of the matter is by creating all of this, the whole point is to tell everybody, you can be better than me because I have gone through all this hardship to try to open doors for as many of you as possible. And I have gone through hell to get here. And now I have opened the door a little bit. I wish for all of you to go in like a stampede and break that door. And I want all of you to go in there. And if I die without that happening, then I have failed. But if I die with the generation of young Arab people and Saudi and Khaliji that have broken that concept of, I am just gonna just do these basic things. I don't wanna go into science. I don't, I don't think I'm gonna be able to be an astronaut. I don't think I'm gonna be able to be an engineer. If I have shifted that mindset, that is true success. And I think it is critical for me to achieve that going to space aspect because once they see that achievement, they cannot take it away. Like humans, I'm not saying they're taking, not the youth, but no one can take away that vision and that sight of, oh my God, this person went through hell and, and worked on herself on her own and struggled and went through there. If she can do it, I can definitely do it. That's the whole point of this whole thing. And to have that, that vision that I just described to you be seen by those young people that is what drives it home for them. That is what makes it a reality for them. And that is what it's important. So Mashal, I just want you to know that from someone who is just really like I look up to you and even if you don't make it, which I'm sure you will, I just want you to know that you living your day every day, sharing your story, hustling, being vulnerable every day, being who you are, opens all our eyes to what we can achieve. I just want to thank you because I think you're such a gift to us and, and to a lot of women in this part of the world. And you do these interviews and you do these speeches and, and you come back again and again and you hound those stories. And I think it's so authentic and it's so real. I'm personally very grateful and I thank you for your service. That's it for this week. Thank you for listening to an episode of the Women Power Podcast. And thank you for downloading and streaming our podcast every week. If you love what you've heard, tag us on Instagram and follow the Women Power Podcast and Women Power Summit account for more information on our next episode. Please leave a rating review wherever you get your podcast. It really helps other women discover the show. That's it from me. See you next week.